Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. For a lot of you who watched the Paralympics, there was something that you might have seen that might have brought up a whole lot of questions for you. The factor system. You saw it in both the alpine skiing and the Nordic skiing. And so we're going to take a little bit of a step back and we're going to talk to the guy who created the factor system. We're going to talk to Ted Fay. Ted, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks, Chris. This is awesome. And this is great because I think people people look at it and go, okay, what does this mean? Because oftentimes we're, we're watching on television or we're, we're watching and talking about it and saying, okay, you can see that the clock is moving slower or not, which was a really challenging thing for anybody as an audience to do, but the clock was effectively moving slower. Can we, can you tell us how, why did the factor system come about? Maybe we'll start at the origin. Yeah, that, that uh, I think it's, well, exploring that for a little bit. So this is 1985, post 84 Olympic and Paralympic year. And I'm gonna actually pull this back a little further because I think this contextualizes it even, even more. So I began uh, my entree into Paralympic sport as a race guide for a totally blind um, cross country skier Harry Cordellis in 1980. So before you joined the team, Chris, right on the cusp of, when did you join? 1990, something like that? 91, I think I made the okay. team in spring of 91. So can you, you know what the environment was there. We were in transitioning from being overseen in terms of sport rules, classification, et cetera, by an alphabet soup group of international sport federations for the disabled. Right, always focused on the disability and not necessarily on the sport. So we're, we're migrating out of a medical model, you know, that, you know, your classification, you were just on that transition period to more of functional classification, look, trying to look at how does your particular disability interface with the sport that you're, you know, competing in. All the way back to 1980, the U.S. sent two teams, not one, two teams, to the Winter Paralympic Games in Yalo, Norway. Frigid Yalo, Norway, uh, where the wax you put on your skis, you didn't even need wax. Polar probably would have worked. So <laughs> sub-zero <laughs> most days. Anyway, we've sent two teams. We sent a blind, visually impaired cross-country team and we sent a standing locomotor disability alpine team. There was no sit skiing at that point, cross country or alpine in 1980. And so there you have it. So the first games were you know, four years before in uh, Sweden and the US sent one athlete, Bill Hervanek, who was a leg amputee, I guess to scout it out, but Essentially, so I can say I was a member of the first winter U.S. Winter Paralympic team and is a race guide. So here we are, and it kind of looked a little weird. I'm just trying to give you a little backdrop here. Looked a little weird. So we are separated and we look different. We have different uniforms. Our whole oversight group from, you know, team captain to coaches, et cetera, all different. I'm trying to remember even if we stayed in the same hotel. The point is the U.S. sent two teams, distinct teams. 1982, same thing happened. We sent two teams. Two to world Switzerland. championships. World championships, right. yeah, okay. same thing. Well, the group groups, you know, overseeing these events, which was a committee on a committee, um, politics on politics, uh, they said, okay, to the U.S., you will not be invited to the 1984 third Paralympic Games unless you come as one team, which means at least we'll be uniform the same. I give you that backdrop because this is kind of, it's gonna to begin to fast forward now. So yours truly retired 
as an athlete. And I stepped into the breach, politically speaking, as a head coach of the standing physically disabled athletes under the umbrella of the National Handicap at the time termed Handicap Sport and Recreation Association. And with our co-friend, Captain Benedict at the helm. So I'm trying to set the stage here intentionally, as you'll see, as we go through the thread until Beijing of this year. So politics matter, personalities matter, the type of sport matters, meaning that the Alpine side from my lens, my our review of some of my um, the athletes that I coached um, was highly political and certainly had the most prominence and the most visibility. And we weren't, we were not very, very good, really. We, we, we didn't compete. We finished way back in the pack. So that's 1983. So I take over the physically disabled side of the equation of Nordic skiing, the US Association for Blind Athletes still continued their role uh, relative to blind visually impaired athletes. Fast forward to 1984, and I'm looking around and I'm going, huh, we haven't really had a true US national championship yet because we don't have enough athletes per classification group that we can have, a, we can have the way the races were organized, as you well know, you were LW10 classified, so you raced against other LW10s. And depending on the event, you might, if there weren't enough LW10s to have a race, be allowed to compete by competing against supposedly um, a athlete in the LW11s with a lesser disability. How many classes in Nordic skiing at that time? There were 13 in alpine skiing. Okay, theoretically, there, well, practically, there were nine LW classes, two B classes, and just we're about to insert two classes sitting. So Nordic has basically been the pilot test, if you will, for lack of a better term, as we go through this whole process, once we get to the factor system. So 1984, Alpine sit skiing still is not an official event. Nordic is. So there we go. We take the step, we take the risk. Um, probably easier because creating a sitting frame on top of Nordic skis is a little bit easier than creating a, you know, super bobsled. I'm, I'm sorry, monoski. Um, so anyway, 1984, we're looking at this. Now, for the first time ever, we combine teams, how we train, who coaches them, et cetera. Problem is we don't have viable races that we can really, um, the results are you know, one or two in a class nationally. So then fast forward to the 1986 World Championships in Sweden. And in this period of time, Alpine and cross country biathlon really hadn't been introduced yet. We're in the same place, same time, um, same venue. Similar to what Lillehammer was this year because of post COVID. Anyway, so there's some new skiers coming into the group, namely Joe Walsh, later it'll be Rob Walsh, his brother from Dartmouth. And Joe and I started chatting saying, hmm, so Joe, help me out here. How can we figure out a system where actually B level racers and standing LW racers? So B being blind or blind, vision impaired, impaired right. yeah. V, you can use a V or B. How are we going to do that? So I said, I have an idea. Let's, let's create a time factor system like, like a golf handicap. And let's look at the data from the 84 games, maybe as far back as the 82 games, you know, world championships, one Paralympic games, and then one world championship. So we have three sets of data. There were no World Cups at the time. It was just these, you know, 
main events every two years. And so we set about creating, we had, I presented a theory, he, he got excited about it. He said, I think it can work. Um, you know, he is a visually impaired athlete, then could actually, actually won medals. So he could act, he had the credibility to convince everybody else, this is the way we're gonna do it. Um, peer to peer from an athlete standpoint, I did the same, I had a little bit more difficulty with some of the so-called LW class folks, um, just because they didn't want to give up any hardware that they had. Um, but they went along with it. They saw that the value of it. And at the same time, the same overlay period from 85, to 86, when we created the system, we were actually also petitioning the US ski team to bring us on as their next two teams that they oversee. So 1986, sign on the dotted line, we become part of the U.S. ski team, Alpine and cross country. Which was the first able-bodied national governing body Ever. To, 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 to then be, you know, to be in control of the, uh, uh, of the, what was the disabled team back then, disabled Correct. Nordic and disabled Alpine team. Correct. Okay. So you have two things going on here now. You have us introducing this radical system, so to speak, and you have us being integrated into the US ski team, first in the world to do that. So from that, we tested it out at the national championships um, and in cross country. I don't think it was introduced yet in Alpine. You were always a little bit behind us. We were always testing this first. You were waiting us for us to fall on our face. And so we tested it out and then we actually started inviting some of our friends from Europe to come join us in our national championships, particularly a couple athletes from Germany and Norway and in in, in Canada as well. And they became our voices of spreading the word of this system. So we actually had a political strategy. We were strategic about this. And then fast forward to the 1988 um, Paralympic games in Innsbruck. And that was the time we, I remember purposefully welcoming the Soviets at the time. And then of course they became the Russian Federation and all of the republics in terms of Kazakhstan and Ukraine and so forth in our sport. So 88 was actually the year that we took a vote in what would become the first, the first sport section in the newly formed organization, the International Paralympic Committee. So we were the first sports section and we already began plotting how we were going to create a whole different, let's say interface in terms of how athletes, you know, would compete using this system. And the reason being is all along, it seemed to me crazy that athletes who were actually really good athletes, but had a particular disability that were unfortunately in an underrepresented class. So it either was on the Nordic side, what we did is we combined, we always combined. But in other sports such as cycling at the time, perhaps alpine skiing, I'm not, I can't remember exactly because I wasn't present in the room when it happened, but we were really fiercely adamant that an athlete, if he or she was good enough, capable enough, we would find a way for them to compete. So essence, the whole factor system presented itself to provide access, equity, because they didn't really have to go and say, well, gee, there's no way in, you know, hell, I can make up, you know, 50 seconds or whatever it is, you know, based on the disparity between disability classifications. So, and it ensured that if someone were to show up, which at that time you classified at the event, I don't know if you remember this, but nowadays it's not that way. But at that time, the only time we did a uh, certified classification was at the event itself, be it world championships or be it um, Paralympic Games. So that designates which class you're in. So you show up and they say you're B1, B2, LW1, LW2, whatever it is. This is the classification that you're going to be in. And, and, and then you're either 
excited or right. you're stuck in yeah. some ways where you just, okay, there's no way that I can possibly be competitive within this group. So this was an effort to level that playing field. You talked yep. about the idea of, of a golf handicap. Right. So we were able to ensure uh, credible um, races, credible athleticism, you know, being displayed. Um, and that was really basically and still is the root of this system is fair play. That because of the nature of our sport and with such a, let's say, spectrum of different disability type, you know, physiotypes, you, me, others uh, that are racing and visually it seems really muddled to a lot of viewers that are initiated. How do you create fair sport out of that? It's not perfect, but what we did was we enabled and ensured an athlete, she or he, that if they were present and once they were classified, so put these two together, once they were going through classification, it wasn't, oh my God, I have nobody to race against. Depending on the sport, I know cycling in uh, Sydney in 2000, probably be the best physically disabled athlete, female athlete, Barbara Buchan from the US. She, she was denied the opportunity to race in Sydney because they had no means or they chose to have no means in which to help her be able to be integrated into a racing class, a racing group. And you take that as an example of a summer sport where in time trialing, she should at least have had the ability to be in that race because that would have been very easy to apply this type of factor system to. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about cross country that made it easier for us in, the, in, in this whole initial period of creation was, you know, individual starts, same as Alpine, but individual starts, no one knows who wins. You have to check your sheet here. You really don't until unless you're in sort of insider in terms of the sport, you really don't know. So-and-so comes across, the crowd yells, and they finish fifth because it's, they're from home country. No one knows. So we had that, um, let, let's say, advantage of creating a system like this because you know the winners were anonymous until you got, got the results or you were you know, looking at your sheet and you put in the time sort of like scoring, uh, not many people do that. So we had the perfect ability to experiment, manipulate, see where you know, our kind of assumptions were right on or not so right on. So what happened was this, and I'll give you kind of a quick history of this um, for your viewers is so to 1992, your first Paralympic Games. Mm -hmm. It was not under the authority of the newly created International Paralympic Committee. It was still under the International Blind Sports Association. It was under the International Organization for Sport for the Disabled, ISOD, um, which actually controlled your race. I was the Nordic chief for both ISOD and <clears throat> the IPC simultaneously in 92. What does that mean? It means we gather a couple times a year, usually in an event. Um, there are certain representatives from various nations that sit around a table and we create the rules. We create the decisions. And whether that's how many groupings do we want in sit skiing? When you entered, there were two. There were three when I entered. We really? had LW10, 11, and 12. The results don't show that. I'm not trying to argue with you, but I oh, didn't. really interesting. Yeah, no, no, you raced in. I oh, think actually, so you're talking about Alberville. So Alberville, there were actually there were two classes in Alberville. Yes, correct. Yes, this was yes because and and to your point, I remember showing up. So I had been winning my class back in '91 and approaching my first games and also approaching my college graduation at the same time. And, and so I went to our first camp and Stefan Hench, who was the head coach, got on the lift with me and we rode to the top and he said, you're not going to make the team this year. And I thought, well, why wouldn't I make the team this year? 
And he said, because they're combining classes. And so, yes, they did go to two classes where you had, you know, it's often the LW11 class is really the class that is effectively like paralyzed from the waist down where they have all of the trunk stability. Whereas my class, really, we have the muscles pretty much below the sternum, maybe, and maybe not even that. And, and, and so we don't have nearly the same balance. And so functionally, you know, you're talking about medically and functionally, medically, there's no, there's no, there's no comparison between the two, right? No, between the LW11 and LW10. Like, I, I remember I actually did my classification in Alberville, and I don't remember who the doctor was, but you get on this, this balance board to figure tilt out table. The, no, the infamous tilt table, they gave it, you a ball, the tilt table, exactly. And you had the ball and you did it. <clears throat> and I did not score well, at all. And, and the guy who was the doctor who was overseeing the whole thing said, if you get better, then I'm going to start a new religion. And I, okay, so I guess I'm in this class then is what it comes down to. But yeah, I was, I was exactly the reason that you're talking about in terms of the factor system, because functionally I could be classed out by this combination of classes because these other guys are supposed to beat me. And that's exactly what Stefan was saying is that these guys are coming down from the class above you. Right. And, and so there won't be any room for you. And so what we can say is over the course of time, since 30 years ago, 1992, Chris Waddell, Team USA, rocking and rolling. Here we go, two class system. Now there's three classes, correct, in Alpine? Actually, now there are five classes of sit skiers where you have LW10-1, LW10-2, LW11, which is the, the parallax on the waist down, and then you have 12-1 and 12-2, the distinction being uh, sort of incomplete paraplegics in 12-1, like people who can walk and stand, yeah. and then, then the amputees. So it's getting to be a finer and finer, which... If you were talking about, because this is this is leading to a certain extent, and I'm stealing your thunder, I guess, to a certain extent. No, I'm glad you are. Go ahead. In, in that, if 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 we were competing with five classes, we'd have really small representation right. in those five classes, and so so what this is doing is the one double amputee or the two double amputees or three double amputees are then allowed to compete against all these other athletes, as opposed to okay, which one of us is going to win this time if there are three of us in the race? And, and suddenly you can be somewhere from first to 25th based on the numbers that are in the other classes as That's well. That's right. That's right. How did the numbers work out? Because I mean, one of the problems that you must have had when you first started is we're talking about a really immature sport. And I'm not talking about the way that people acted, but I'm talking about in terms of defining the classes, in terms oh, of absolutely. training. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and people need to understand that when we started and sent our first Team USA, I know you might have international viewers, but when Team USA showed up as two teams in Yilo, we paid our own way. When we went to Innsbruck four years later, we paid our own way. So, you know, I think it's fabulous that U.S. Paralympians get the same bonus podium bonuses as Olympians. That's the way it should be. But we have to remember, we paid our own way to the games. You know, we had to be a part of raising money for other things that were associated, you know, whether it's equipment, whether it's, you know, uniforming, whatever it might be, not just the plane ticket. And so, yeah, we were immature in terms of organizational heft to be able to do, and I still, I push this forward to the IBC, IPC, there's a little tangent in 20, 20, two, 2003 and 2005 before the Torino games. I wanted to do a film study in the um, Salt Lake uh, games of 20, 2002 to bring in more biomechanical analysis to bring in also more physiological analysis, because depending on our sport, now we're, you know, 
so-called the pain sport because we're going over distance. We're not doing our sport quickly. And so what impact does distance, for example, have on a particular disability classification? What changes? We know when you're just like your courses, you have tough courses, you have easy courses, depending on the discipline. Well, we have two disciplines, it's skating and classic. You have basically a disciplines surrounded by how many gates you got to go around. Mm -hmm. um, so in theory, similar, but very different in practice, especially as the interface of the sport per se meets a person's disability. Having a neurological disability, distance is not my friend. I have more spasticity the longer I go. And so all of these really how does, nuanced... that, how does that work with a training effect too, right? Because, yeah. because you're talking about separating, you're talking about subjective versus objective data, yeah. right? But then there's the, then there's the, the data, the, the, the objective data, but how does that objective data relate to the training effect? Because I mean, exactly. you get tired as well. So your form goes, goes wrong. How do, you, these, how do you differentiate? All these factors is, this is, this is a proposal never accepted by the way. Uh, but we said, we need to look at other elements to this. So it's not just a medical model, you either have a limb or don't. You either are, you have a severed spinal column at a certain level or not. You know, these cuts are not that simple. We know that you, you experienced that. I actually moved from being team coach in the eighties to being the TD of three games. So actually overseeing the classifiers as well as the competition crew in terms of getting, you know, the race ready. And then I moved into being a technical classifier for three games. And this is what you're getting into. This is the kind of knowing the sport and saying, we aren't asking all the right questions, folks. Exactly. You're not. And this is the right. interface between classification and this time factor system. They are different. They have essentially a different purpose on one hand, but actually, they're you know siblings. One does not beget the. I mean, the, it's you have to take both into play here. So, so in saying that, why don't you define then what it means? So, so let's let's start with classification. Yep. What's the objective of classification? Is to grouping someone as closely as you can with someone that, that performs similarly to you do. So to their functional ability. Right. So, so creating- In the, the given sport. Within you the know. sport, yep. within the context of that sport. And then the factor system, what is the objective of the factor system? Is to take those- groupings and then compare them how they compete against each other so for example if someone below the knee amputee lw4 is going to have in theory more ability to perform as to someone who's an lw2 essentially above the knee amputee keep it simple right or likewise if someone's using one pole next to someone who's using two skis, in my sport anyway, two skis and two poles. So you're taking into what implements, what's the equipment, okay? So you, you're you looking at different equipment, so are we. And so the question is, how do those compare on a, in, a, in the same race, same time, same weather conditions, same homologation in terms of ups and downs and le levels and flats? Was it a tough course? Was it okay, whatever, easy course? How do they compare? And you really look at as much data as you can. Because an easy course, a flat course, is going to give you a different result in terms of how those two athletes, one below the knee, one above the knee, perform. Because it the easier the course, the flatter the course, it harmonizes the difference between those disability groups. Tough course real high climbs, steep 
curves, et cetera. So it's a technical downhill course in cross country, for example, same in your, your case, you're looking at a technical versus, you know, how the speed and, you know, relates to that. The higher the profile of a course, the more climb, the more descent. In cross country skiing, suddenly you see the separation between is really very, very distinct. So it's understanding the sport. It's saying, theoretically, this is what we would expect to see. Now let's go prove it. Let's go prove our hypothesis that this is the case, which is looking at race performance data under pressure, under stress, as opposed to let's just go out and play games here and kind of see how you do. It so the hypothesis that you're saying is that it is exactly to take a little bit of a step back, right? You're saying that someone who is who is going with two with two skis and two poles will be faster than someone who has two skis and one pole. Correct. Right? So is missing missing an arm or yeah. or you know missing a leg that that if you have if you have a knee you're going to be faster than someone who does not have a knee who's missing cinematically, you know biomechanically physiologically, it all plays into it. Hence, yes. In theory, two equally trained, two equally skilled, all things being equal. Yeah, someone with two poles and two skis is going to be faster. Right. And, and, and the visually impaired athletes in Nordic skiing are actually the ones who are the fastest because the B3s, the, that's right. The, the least sighted or the uh, the most sighted of the visually impaired athletes because because physiologically they have they they have the symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah look we'll give you an example marla runyon right 1996 paralympic heptathlete in atlanta 2000 in sydney she's an olympian running 1500 meters has a bad luck she pulls a hammy you know, before the final and everybody goes, oh, well, gee, it's gee, gee. I said it had nothing to do with her vision. It had to do with the fact that she pulled a hamstring. Hello. So a, a very able body type injury, you know. Um, so there's a grand example of someone who proves the case you just made. Someone who's a, you know, um, B3, V3, whatever you want to call the classification, you know, can't drive a car legally, but can see and depending, but that's again, depends on the light. When we had a, <laughs> the US nationals were Anchorage, Alaska, flat light, B3s became pretty, pretty solid B2s. Fair enough, fair enough. So, you know, you have to take that into account too. So there's all these extraneous factors, but the hypothesis is yes. The more, let's say, you're like a so-called able-bodied skier, able-limbed skier, able-sighted skier, um, the more you present yourself as, theoretically, you should as well trained and as skilled, you should be faster. That's that's the hypothesis. That's the hypothesis, and and I'm going to throw at you an alpine example because it should be the it should be similar on the alpine side, right? I mean, not necessarily yep. the visually impaired are not going to be not going to be as fast because vision is is a far greater uh, need in alpine skiing. But looking at like the below the knee amputee the LW4 versus the above the knee amputee. And when I was skiing, the above the knee amputee in slalom was, was the 100% the classification. So you would, you know, the theory would say that that person who has more limb to work with, has the knee to work with, should be faster. But in slalom, the LW2s were actually faster because they could they could effectively go straighter. They did not have to get two legs. Yeah, they had one ski, right? So who knew? And they had one, one ski. One ski was an advantage in the slalom. Which is funny, you know. So this is this is what we're what you're looking at in terms of going from that theory to the practice of how does this shake out? And and the other part that's that's a little bit harder too is you're basing it on. How are you basing it? Are you basing it on individuals? Are you basing it on 
on, on a wide range of people because creating this factor, if you're basing it on an individual, one individual could be great for their class and another could be not so good. That's right. And how does and, that and that's right. And, and it depends on who you pick. And then you're either, you know, you're not going to be happy with the result either way, because as you and I have talked before, the ebb and flow of athletes. So you have an outlier. When, when this is the other thing we need to present here is that that you know some athletes, like it happened in this last, you know, games in Beijing, is you happen to have um a snowboarder, two snowboarders, as a matter of fact, who were not going to be allowed to compete in the games because there was not enough athletes in their group. And, you know, between the two, Cecile Hernandez and Brenda Huckabee, they traded goals. They, they just actually pushed away the other group who was in theory supposed to be faster, right? And they were not going to be allowed to compete. So here's the point in 2022 that we were trying to really push into not just the conversation, but the practice in 1992, which we did in cross country. In cross country, we actually, I went back and looked at all these results. We combined classes as we needed to, particularly in the women's category, unfortunately, because there are fewer women athlete in our sports, respective sports than there are men. Just it's a fact it's not what we want there's an equity issue in terms of raising you know the pool of talent on the women's side but this is what you're presented with and so in 92 we combine classes but without percentage okay in 94 we combine classes and a number of classes with percentage that was the first time that the percent system was ever used in a winter Paralympic games it was 94. 94, you utilize the factor system. We utilize the factor systems, but they were subclusters. They were not just the three, three you know, groupings we have now of standing, sitting, and, and B classes. They were clustered. So like, for example, in the, in the women's classes, standing there all combined because there weren't enough athletes in any one classification group to stage race so they were combined they were combined with percentage with a factor system likewise it depended on a race but sitting is for women as well and so the first time ever used the factor system ever used to award medals 1994 Nordic, biathlon, and cross country, Lillehammer. Which is interesting, and and so so from ninety two combining classes, which you're talking about without Brenna, percentage, and yeah. So she's an above the knee amputee, who there were not enough above the knee amputees in snowboarding, to to have a class to fill a class, but she and her and her competitor there were able to compete as a above the knee amputees against below the knee amputees that's right in snowboarding and and be at the top of the metal table at the top of the podium and and, and that i mean i mean versus my 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 uh, example of the lw2 in slalom where where, where in some ways they had a bit of a competitive advantage in that they didn't have to go as far around the gate. Right. And it played out that way. And I don't think any LW2 would argue that case. I no. think that that's no, exactly they wouldn't. What, what they would say as well. But looking, looking at the snowboarding, I can't see that there's an advantage for someone who is an above the knee amputee versus someone who's a below the knee amputee. These happen to be two really great athletes so how exactly. do you account for the great athletes do they just skew your whole your whole system or how does that work that, that's a that's a great question which i failed to answer about five minutes ago so really in in creating this system we look at aggregate we, like a, a mean time or an average time per grouping because you really want to minimize having the outlier effect either way in other words, this class is just traditionally slow because they're not very good trained. They're not very well trained. Right. So you assume that's the best this class can be. And because you've not seen anything to 
dissuade you from that notion observation, I, right? Yeah. On the other hand, you can have a outlier in a class that again skews what normatively most in that racing group, in this case above in the amputees, would their results. So you're really always looking at a grouping or cluster in terms of how you evaluate what is that average time differential, the factor, the time factor, the percentage, the handicap in a given event. Um, you know, and you make adjustments now in Alpine based on the, the event, how many gates you're going around matters. Okay. In cross country, technique matters. You know, whether you're skating, depending on your disability or your uh, skiing classic. So those were always intentionally taken into the model. That's a challenge, isn't it? Because I mean, when you're talking about a lack of representation in the classes, the, the argument can be made that each person in the class is effectively an outlier. Is That's true. And in the LW3 class in cross country and the LW9 class in cross country, that's absolutely true. And I'll give you an example. 2002, Steve Cook, one of the all time best ever cross country, Paralympic cross country athletes for the United States, multiple gold in Torino, multiple silver in Salt Lake, even though going into Salt Lake, he was the top ranked cross country standing physically disabled athlete in the world, male. And below the knee amputee, right? Steve below Cook. the knee amputee, cyclist from Heber City. He was not only a homeboy, that was literally his home turf in Soldier Hollow, which is right over there. Um, so here we have the press is all over this excitement, you know, we, we cross country wise, we haven't had that much success, well, metal here, metal there, but not, not really this sort of, wow, this is his moment. And then it happened. I was the one of two technical classifiers for that event. And out of the Norwegian wood comes this 18 year old who couldn't put his feet parallel if it was life and death. The way he kind of sauntered and the way he ambulated, he was an LW3. Could have been classified an LW9. Up to that point, we have never seen anybody look like him, classify like him, and ski like him. So he was in a class where there was a variable percentage, depending on the intensity of the, of the multiple disability you know, uh, he had. He wasn't an amputee. He wasn't, he's using two poles and two skis, but he couldn't bring them parallel. At least at that point, he had to train years and years to bring them parallel. They were gonna go this naturally. So I watched him ski. And, and describe describe what LW3 is, like what that classification is. Okay, it's 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 basically a bilateral multiple disability above and below. Um, it's actually below, it's actually that one is defined below below the waist essentially. So he um, he would be similar to uh, a double amputee. Mm -hmm. A double above the knee amputee. Yeah, even though, yeah, likely, yeah. In terms of but body. he was fully limbed. He just, and so he, his disability was more neur neurologic than, you know, obviously with loss of limb. Or as we talked about the other day, um, LW9, which I would classify into as being only one hemisphere above and below the waist, essentially. Right. Um, so he was in a combi class. He was in a difficult class to classify to begin with because it wasn't straightforward. He wasn't missing something. He didn't have a clear lesion in terms of where, you know, whether he's incomplete or complete in terms of his spinal column. So he was, 
you kind of have to watch. This is a functional question. This is why we have technical classifiers is saying, okay, what do we see? And that was, you know, a difficult moment for me because I had to classify him because the other classifier was from Norway. And Anna Reinhold was recused from classifying her own athlete. So I get the pleasure of classifying Hans Eric Olset. 18 years old. And I knew immediately that Cookie was screwed. He was because, screwed. This, because there had not really been a factor that was established within this class that was that identified him. That, that accurately identified him. Exactly. Had he shown up at an event prior to that games, we'd have fixed it because we had the ability to do that prior to the games. But once the games started, we weren't going to go in saying, well, we'll change this, this percentage and that percentage. At that point, the books, pun intended, were cooked. We, the, the percentage I had, I gave him the maximum percentage I could, knowing in my mind, he skis. So I went through before I got on tonight, and I, I looked at 2002, 2006, and 2010. He skied as an 84% factor athlete in 2002. He skied as a 87% factor athlete in 06. And he skied as an 89% factor athlete in 2010. A couple of things happened. He got older, he got better trained and so forth but he emanated out as a really accomplished athlete. And oh yeah, I was his technical classifier for all three of those games. And I'm happy to report the equity factor is once we got it more right than we had in 02, because we didn't have a choice, then we had ability to manipulate something like that. We had you know, an athlete we hadn't seen before, the, the outlier effect. Um, you know, we never claimed that this was absolutely perfect, but it was more fair than anything else we have. Um, Steve Cook won two gold medals in 06. Bullset finished with silver, bronze, and out of the pack in 06. So we're getting it more correct. But yeah, this has always been the challenge, always been the worry that you want to be able to see these athletes before the main events, world championships, uh, Paral Winter Paralympic Games, to prevent this very thing. At that point, we were still classifying athletes new to the scene up to the moment before their first race. And so it was the, that administrative system that complicated the actual management of the race. But yes, I was involved in quite a, quite a I won't call it a scandal, I would call it a challenge in terms of being uh, dealing with the media during the Salt Lake City games because they were really interested in who is the person, and I won't say it, what they referred to that person as. Um, I, you know, I have kid, grandkids too. Uh, but anyway, let, suffice to say, I wasn't referred to in a very positive light once they found out that I was had something to do with creating this system. Um, now, I had helped creating the system. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, Pat myself on the back. Yeah, I had the concept, but I had a lot of help from a number of people as we went along um, from a number of nations, including, you know, the Walsh brothers who helped me initially create it nationally as we wait, though, we were always looking, how can we create the most, let's say, uh, exceptional race, meaning we have a group of athletes in one race that was not a field of four or five, but it was a field of 15 to 25. Um, that we didn't reward the benefit of those who were in an underrepresented class who were not very good athletes, which did happen in the era when I was head coach. The disparity and ability, you know this, the disparity and ability is really closed. Sure. Uh, and the whole athletic risen, amazingly. Um, but 
you don't want to reward something just because they happen to be the only one, not because they were good enough to actually warrant whatever medal they may have won. Which they earned it, a medal. They won. They a earned medal. a medal as opposed to they were given a medal. How does this work? Because you see it on the golf side, right? You started with the analogy to a golf handicap, and and the acrimony comes in golf when when someone has a significantly higher handicap than they play. So yep. they are getting more strokes per hole than, than, than they should, or at least by perception of other people. And how do you, how do you range that? You know, because, because the thing is, I mean, you're talking about empirical data, yep. but then you're also talking about trying to, trying to account for outliers that don't necessarily fit and, and also not necessarily having the demographic potential to, to completely justify, am I, am I okay in saying that? The, the, the factors, you know, just that, 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 I mean, this, this becomes more and more valid, the more data you have. Absolutely. And we have 35 years of data. The early data was good, but wasn't great. But the more data we have from World Cups, so you can just kind of test every once in a while, are we missing something? Are we seeing something? Are we seeing an anomaly? But really, again, you want to base it on events where no one can, <laughs> this is the analogy to golf, can sandbag. So basically just pack it in and suddenly, because the event they're in, it doesn't matter, but then they're in an event that does matter and they have this wonderful handicap. That, I think that the system has really been able to uh, mitigate very well because you're looking at events that matter, world championships, uh, Paralympic games, and if in their multiple events, it's not like on that individual, it's on the group. That's the other reason that the group, what are the, the sort of average times of metal potential athletes in that group? And now you have a pretty good comparative to yet another group. And you have a full field as well. Exactly. Exactly. So most full field. So how does this, like we, we watched Beijing yep. and, and we saw both the Nordic and we saw the Alpine. And, you know, I, I think that there were, I mean, there might be some questions from the athletes and from the general public with regard to classification. And, and I heard some grumbling on the cross country side with regard to classification, but they're really, I, I didn't hear any real grumblings with regard to the factor system, to the factor system being unfair. Do you, I mean, because it, it's hard for you to take both things separately, right? I mean, they, as you said, they are intertwined, both the factors. They're, they're, they're only intertwined at race time. Right. They're intertwined. That's when they're intertwined. But the reality is what, yeah, this grumbling has been going on time immemorial. Well, so-and-so, they're really a blah, 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 you know, in terms of their classification. And I can get in the weeds on that one in a minute. So, but we separate the two because the factor system simply accepts to it whatever classification that athlete brings to it at the start. The factor system doesn't classify people. Classifiers do. Right. The factor system is whatever grouping you're in, you're in. I'll give you another story. 2005, leading up to the um, 06 games in Torino. So, for whatever reason, I, over time, I have established, I had established a very trustful relationship with the chief interpreter of the Russian team. Um, I guess diplomacy does matter because I welcomed them to a team captain's meeting in 1988, and he remembered. Fast forward to 2005, now I'm a technical classifier, and at World Championships in Fort Kent, Maine. And for the first time, we're going to film 
the classification. To my knowledge, first time ever used. Okay. And what, why is that significant? I'll tell you. So as you know, having experienced classification, you come into the room, right? And you probably are asked to disrobe to uh, maybe not a, a you know a um, improper level, but they want to see if you have any muscles, correct? Especially right. around, you know, you <laughs> do you have an ab do you have a six pack or not, Chris? And, and, and when you're moving, it, do you see any movement from exact, those? Exactly. Exactly. So. We were told that, I can remember it distinctly, I'm just standing in the hallway, kind of relaxed, you know, and so when the next, and my friend comes up in this very halting English, he said, Ted, 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 our athlete's going to cheat. <laughs> Your point, you're trying to sandbag, you're trying to get into a better class, you know, it's going to, to improve your chances of a podium finish. So uh, he actually got busted before the classification, or at least we got, you know, some intel about the fact he's going to try to cheat the tilt table, the ball test. Man, he did a masterful job. So how did you know? I mean, other so, than so it's coming. So we we oh. didn't know. We we were alerted that he was going to cheat or try to cheat. So we were on you know on our sort of most steely eyed you know viewing of you know what's he trying to do? Let's look at this closely. Da, 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 da. Did we check everything? And then we go huddle. And at that time, we were also training some classifiers which I will not disclose any names, but one of the trainees was just very empathetic to the athlete. Fine. We go sort of around the curtain and we basically actually made a mistake. We weren't really very nice. We didn't hand this young man his t-shirt. We didn't do a few other things, but the film is running. Everybody forgot there was a camera rolling. We go back in. We, we you know, he, he excuses himself. Blah blah blah. We push, we push the button. And went, oh, huh? He's got a lot of hip flexion there, doesn't he? Well, gee, look at that. He reached all the way down to the floor and picked up his socks, and he put them on himself easily. Amazing. Busted busted so this is the <laughs> this is the classification without being classification yeah basically it was like you know it came to a point where in torino this is a year later we were not as technical as as classifiers technical and functional weren't allowed in in the uh, cafeteria we couldn't observe hmm. in living which you know as an athlete is exactly what we need to see. We need to see you on the track and we need to, or on the pist, and we need to see you in sport and we need to see you in life. And then we can put together saying, well, are you a 10, a 10.5? Hmm. Maybe you're 11, actually. We don't, we don't know until we have some of that more artful observational data. So that's really where the athletes get into this. Well, I saw so-and-so do this or that. They can't do this or that to be in this class. Well, we didn't get a chance to observe that, right? Because we're in this little box. You come in, we say hello, and we do this. My job and Anaranhal's job was to go out on the track and actually you know, hide behind a tree and watch them go up and down the hill and do some other things. Um, so that's why the technical classifier role came became so important for a while. It, it is interesting. So this has been 30 plus years, right? Right. Or 30 years. And how do you feel about the system now? It's had a while to evolve, 
you've you've fine-tuned it we've just had a games what where, where do you feel it is is it is it as valid as it should be good question it's a <laughs> i think it's been battle tested i think it's been pressure tested you're talking about the factor system i'm going to separate that from classification for a minute right um i think the factor system is an extraordinarily fair race management system i think it's proven it's worth over and over and over again and like you said you didn't hear any grumbling about the athletes complaining about the factor system they complained about classification. And unfortunately, that's been time immemorial, but it's the nature of our sport, isn't it? Is that we do need to somehow assess, you know, roughly, you know, how we compare to each other, assuming we're in the same or near the same class. Uh, it really gets weird when it's on the bubble, when someone's incomplete, where it then becomes training effect matters greatly. You know, and the other thing I will say um, is there was a period since right before Vancouver, starting probably Torino, where I can tell you as a classifier, I was under a tremendous amount of duress, not from the athletes, because I was lucky enough that both Anna and I came from the sport. We had been there for a long time. Athletes trusted us. You know, even when I was a head coach of a team competing against them. Uh, but I had been TD for three games, 92, 94, and 98. And so I actually had the ability to get to know these athletes from a, a whole host of countries um, and to, to keep and maintain their trust. Um, but what I was not very pleased about in um, 06 and onward for a while, is there seemed to be a movement within the folks in Bond to make every sport the same. In other words, when you classify functional disability, what's that? Is disability dynamic or is it fixed? Is it permanent? And we've seen that with a number of US athletes anyway in swimming, in other sports, be so-called unclassifiable. You're not classifiable anymore. You were classifiable for these two games, but now nothing's really changed with your disability, but we're, you're somehow magically unclassifiable. Why? Because you're on the margins. Mm -hmm. and, and so if someone has a visual impairment, unless you have two prosthetic eyes, that changes. It gets worse, it might get better, it's dynamic. If you have a neurological disability, every day is a different day. I mean, quite literally, every day is a different day. Right. You know, you know that too. I mean, it's just how how absurd to say we only want to create a permanent, you know, we want only want athletes who have a permanent classification, which was the operate operative uh, philosophy of the group overseeing classification, I don't think right now, but it was back, let's say between Vancouver and Hyung Chang, 2018. And so what that does is it creates even more stress in terms of people who are trying to do the best job they can. They need the most science that they can utilize to do it well. Mm -hmm. And I would say if there is one thing that the IPC really needs to um, invest more in is the science of classification, not the factor system, the science of classification. Don't screw up, screw with what works and what's worked for, you know, now building on a robust data set for over 30 years. But because of the nature of, of just the reality of having a disability and being an athlete, you know, some years we train well, some years we don't, you know, sometimes for whatever is occurring, 
you know, emotionally, mentally, ain't the right time. Sometimes it is. But add all that to the fact that we have to somehow to make this work, we have to try to approximate the best we can in terms of comparing one grouping like type with another. But from a standpoint of the factor system, I, I thank you for sharing that, by the way, as far as your hearing about among athletes that they weren't grousing about the factor system. Uh, I, I didn't hear anything about it. So that so I think that that does sound successful. And yeah, to, to your point, athletes are athletes, human beings in general. Anytime yeah. you're in competition, you're looking for an advantage. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, we have to go in with our eyes open with regard to the to the yeah. classification system, because this is an exploitable advantage, potentially. And there was an argument back in the late 90s. Well, shouldn't we each have our own individual percentage? And we said no. Reason being the variance in terms of bodies to bodies, trained well, skill, whatever. There's too many factors when you go to the start line, uh, whether you have, you know, you're, suddenly you had a spaz attack in your brain and you didn't ski well. You cut it too close, Waddell, to a gate. You know, stuff never happened. happened. Never happened. Yeah. Point being, though, is we really push back on the fact that if we went to an individual classification, now there's some dis, there's some groupings that have a variance right. because of the nature of the disability, but to have an individual classification would be all. I mean, not classification. Time factor. Individual factor, right? In individual factor would be absurd. In my mind, yeah, I think it would I think be impossible to do anyway. It, it would, and and effectively, it would tell you that you had a good day today, or you had a a bad day today. Yeah, with relation to other people, right. because effectively, what's going on with the factor system is that it is how you're doing based on a historical stand historical standard that has been set with regard to how other people in the race are doing against the historical standard that has been set for their class. And, and with the ability to adjust it as it seemed to be necessary, such as Hans Eric Olset, it was clear his disability was gonna challenge us because we were at that point, he was an outlier. He wasn't in a, a grouping of 10 other athletes, he was one. You know, and therefore um, that become that does become a challenge. You know, fair question: How do you treat someone like that? Well, you observe, you observe, you observe, you test the hypothesis against his performance over and over again, um, and you do the best to get it right. You know, and um, you know, there's always going to be some variance there, but you just don't want to make it so gross that it guarantees him a medal if he stands up. Well, Ted, I mean, we've got to wrap it up, but I appreciate you being on the sharp edge of, <laughs> of trying to evolve this sport and trying to create an environment in which people can compete on a level playing field, that they won't be excluded for underrepresentation. Yeah, I mean, and, and to that point, I know we're wrapping up, but to that point, I just did a historical analysis and prep for tonight. We basically wouldn't have uh, cross-country skiing or biathlon for only probably one group of female athletes in the Winter Games. They're all there's it's subgroups combined together that you know at least in the standing classes. You know, you you in and to me that would be a travesty. That alone would be a travesty. Exactly. So that was exactly your point, that you don't have the numbers to justify a classification, to justify a race. And, and this is what the factor system is doing, is leveling that playing field and creating a full field out of what could be a disparate group of individuals. Absolutely. Yeah. And you have high sport. Exactly. And, and it is competitive and it, may, it makes it competitive on every single day. You're not just beating one person 
you are you're trying to trying to top the whole field. So yeah, absolutely. This is, this is this is so cool. And and thank you for explaining it. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to understand what is going on and why it's going on. And 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 also that most often the best person is winning. Correct. That's right. That's right. And um, so, yeah, it's been it's been a wild ride. You know, I'm I'm looking back at a lot of things right now, and you know, just from a standpoint of what data do we have historically, not even from a fact time factor system, but who competed. So we're still trying to fill in a lot of important information for folks who I will I will say our era, I was a little bit before you. Uh, but to me, that's important because then it tells more of a total story. And within that, this becomes, you know, a chapter in that story, if you will, in terms of how the race, how, how the sports, Alpine and cross country have evolved, why they're organized the way they are, you know, who's the best, you know, and as we really move into, um, I think yet an, another era, and that is, I just saw, you may have seen this, but the IPC is in negotiations or has made an agreement with the International Ski Federation. This is a deja vu moment for me uh, to move world para Nordic and world para Alpine to the FIS. We were having those com same conversations in 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90. You know, Jack Benedict and I and others were having those very conversations with the FIS back then. Now it's going to happen, it looks like. So that's, that's again, a point of integration into the sport. Well, yeah, it's a point of integration. And it's also, I mean, I think the thing that's really interesting is that it's interesting integration and we're getting a lot more exposure for the sport as well and i exactly. think that, that that one the system has to stand up because if it doesn't stand up the general public is going to notice it right, That's and, right. and so it's so it's a vetting you know the two it's, it's a vetting system in in a lot of ways it, it has to show up as as viable competition and as as entertainment but it, it has to be the competition. It has to marry those two because that's exactly where we are. It, it's exactly it. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for all of the work that you've done. Thank you for joining us, for taking the time, for continuing to do more research to be as prepared as possible for this conversation. And, and it's an ongoing conversation. And it that's, is. That's the great part, uh, continuing to, you know, this, is, this is a scientific approach, right? Where you, you never feel like you've, You've answered the question completely that if somebody pokes a hole in your theory, you go back and look at it and go, is that a valid, is that a valid argument against our theory? And absolutely. Can we, can we change That's, it? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hey, happy to be a part this of this. Well, Good. I, I look forward to seeing you in person one of these days. We'll definitely make that happen. But thank Good. you for all the conversations and helping us as we've been going through the games. Uh, thank you to all of you for tuning in. If, uh, you know, I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation. The greatest gift you can give us is to go and tell your friends. Tell your friends, like us, follow us. This will be a traditional podcast. And the greatest thing you can do for us is to get out there and share it and tell people, hey, there's a great conversation going on here. You need to tune in. So thanks to all of you. And we'll look forward to seeing all of you later. Mm -hmm.